What's up, everybody? I am Richard. And I'm Sean. And together, we are speaking the language of romance. Oh, my little petite muffin biscuit. How I've missed you. I've missed your face. And all of the things about you. Richard, I want to take us back to a simpler time in life. I want to go back to 14, 15-year-old Sean. Sitting in the back of the bus, listening to his Annie Skip CD player with his awesome headphones over the ear headphones. <laughs> it still skipped anyway. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. You had like five second skip. You hit that because you sat at the back of the bus and then you hit a bump and then you're like, "Fuck!" There it goes. Well, and you didn't realize like it was just like a little memory thing. So you'd sit there and like tap it, not realizing that you're fucking your CD up even worse. Like, yeah, look, I can hit it yeah. for ten seconds. I was gonna say you like whenever it skipped, it was always like, "Oh God, did I? Is the is it broken? Is it?" Is it going to always scratch? At the, is it always going to skip at that point now? Yeah. Oh, and this is a time of CD books. Those uh, CD, uh, what do you call it? Oh, called? don't get oh. me started. Oh, I had two huge ones. Yeah. I I had two 100 book CDs full. Uh, I've got a like a 25 and maybe a 51, like a small two back to back and then one that's got four. Yeah. Oh, that was like school a school books. Who needs school books? Toss. Yeah. <laughs> all those things like you carried around all over. The other thing that I loved is I always had to pick out a great sticker for it to throw on the back. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. My favorite was it said 68 and I owe you one. Ha ah, nice. Yeah. What was the nice. other one? The other one was a uh, sex instructor, first lesson free. <laughs> Classic times. Classic times is the 2000s. I would probably uh, say, you know, the greatest generation, obviously. Um, <clears throat> I mean, we didn't fight a war, but um, it was close. I mean, they didn't they didn't make us go fight a war, but there were some people over there fighting. What was the other things that were great about this time frame? It's CDs, your stickers, thong song, obviously was a big hit. <laughs> Good old Cisco. Yes. But, Richard, I found this article. It was originally published in the August 1999 issue of Spin Magazine. Oh, okay. Okay. I remember Spin Magazine. I also vaguely remember 1999. I was 17 years old. I was just about, I was in eighth grade. Coming up close to graduating eighth grade, getting into the high school time frame of my life. I was 13, had the whole world in front of me. Yeah, this would have been the start. Yeah, this would have been the start of my senior year of high school. Did you graduate your senior year in 2000? Yeah. Okay, that'll be easier to remember. So we graduated, you graduated high school the same year I graduated eighth grade. Yeah. So the title yeah, of this I article, graduated Richard, in 2000, and you said this was August 99. So this, yeah, this would have been the start of my senior year of high school. So I guess, do you want me to bury the lead and not give you the title so we don't know who we're talking about? You'll find out pretty quick, um, I think. I'm sure I'll find out pretty quick. You you can you can conceal it, but I I I mean if you're if you're talking music the music scene in in circa 1999, I think I think I can I think I can get it. Because the first line tells you who is it about. So let me give you the the title list. Let's see if you can figure it out. It says how to succeed in business. By really, really trying. Okay. All right. 1999. Hmm. Just on the the break of some rock kind of taking the stand back after pop. Who would oh, really, really I was be so tr- glad about that. Yeah. That oh, was good I was time. so happy. Yeah, because oh, 2000, time. you had, at least on my music, you had Linkin Park. You had Papa Roach. Taproot was coming out pretty quick. Uh, who's some other bands? Corn was, was there. Corn was still going strong. Corn. Corn was at album number three by that point. So this is like right before they, for me, for me personally, this is right before they kind of like fell off a little bit. But oh my God, like Corn, I listened to that first CD like on repeat. And that first CD came out in like 95. Yeah, I can't remember which one. I think I got into the one that came out about this time. Because, I, like I said, I was 13. So, so that would have been Follow the Leader. Follow the Leader was 99. Yeah, it would have been their next one then. Because I, I just started getting into music, more specifically the music I listen to now, like in 2000. Because I remember Cause, staying yeah, home. Yeah, there was sick. their self-titled one, and then there was Life is Peachy, and that was the second one. 
and then follow the leader. Follow the leader was 1999. I know that because I saw them in concert in in December of 99 on the Family Values tour. It was it was Corn. It was God. Who else was there? Ice Cube, Orgy. Oh, Orgy Limp was Biscuit. pretty sweet. Limp Biscuit was there. Mm, well, Richard, let's talk some Limp Biscuit. Oh, God, this is about Limp Biscuit. Hot dog flavored water. Oh, my Jesus. Uh, Issues was the uh, corn album I got into. Okay, that was yeah, that was, one. that was number four. Um, I think I bought that one. I'm sure I bought that one. So, Richard, let's take... Man, Limp Biscuit. I saw them in 98. Because they were at Ozfest for some reason, who the fuck knows? But I, the only thing I remember about the Limp Biscuit show in '98 was they were they had for some reason, no idea why, some reason, giant fucking toilet on stage. I'm talking like a twenty foot tall toilet. Yeah, because there was. In, when was Woodstock '99? Because wasn't that when uh, Limp Biscuit like set fire to everything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I kind of probably need to thank somebody that I didn't get into music till 2000 because I could have been a big Limp Biscuit fan. You probably could have been. I could, I could 100% see that. Because it was, I don't mean that in a bad way, but I could totally see that. Well, you're right in that like uh, age. Oh, and DMX was at Woodstock '99 too. R.I.P. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so listen to this Woodstock uh, lineup, Richard. You've got DMX. Yep, Limp Biscuit. Uh, Corn. Okay. Yeah. Red yeah. Hot Chili Peppers. Ooh, nice. And Creed. <laughs> Oof. Oof. But I say like I could have been a, a Limp Biscuit fan because like that's the impressionable age where you'd be like, oh man, this is like real music. Oh yeah, this is yeah. like your This ain't your dad's rock and roll. Yeah. Come to find out it's nobody's rock and roll. That was mm. yeah, July. So did man, like I, I have a did, uh, I I okay. Full confession: I did own a Limp Biscuit album. I owned. I own Chocolate Starfish. I I I you know what? I don't think I own Chocolate Starfish, but I will. I will probably guess that my wife owned Chocolate Starfish, and so it got merged into my into my CD collection. Try to see. So one. it's there. So, yeah, because- I did have three dollar bill, y'all. Three dollar bill, y'all. Actually, wasn't a half bad album. Yeah, I remember hearing like their first single off that. It's like you're about as weird nah, as it was a counterfeit. three dollar bill. No, it was counterfeit. Counterfeit was their first. No, the first single off that one was that that cover they did of uh, Faith. That was like that was like their big. That was like their big thing. Yeah, like when they first when they first kind of came out, they were like, "Look, we redid George Michael, and it's all hard." <laughs> Cause we're hard, <laughs> but that uh, that song counterfeit. That's not that's not a bad, not a half bad song. Is that the one that's got the line "You're about as weird as a three dollar bill"? Maybe. Freaking I remember seeing out. that like years down the road. Because I didn't even hear Faith when that came out. I like I heard those songs like after Nookie. Because Nookie is where they like exploded. Oof. Yeah, unfortunately, Nookie's honestly where I was like, "No, we're done here." Yeah, I mean, well, then they had that and break stuff. It was like just like back to back, like, oh yeah, we're into this. But break but yeah. stuff was okay. Break stuff. It was a good rage bad. song. Good they, rage song. They had a um, a new album that came out that was a little bit more rock influenced. That there's a couple songs that were okay. But yeah, after uh, so I read this article ahead of time just to kind of prepare and. You know, you think about this. So faith is already out. This is about the time they were working on significant other. And yeah, the time they were getting the Nookie video set up. So you're talking about like a guy who had a pretty successful album after doing a cover and they're about ready to start their second album, but they're not like, they're not on TLR live. That's total request live for kids out there who didn't know, because back in the day you would TRL, rush TRL. You said TLR. Oh, TRL. You gotta get it right for the kid for the kids at home. Yeah. Cause they don't know TRL total request live with Carson Daly. Yeah. Painted fingernails. That's like a guy who I feel like he found like a job. He's like, he's like, maybe this will lead to something cool. And then he does that for like 15 years. He's like, I just wish I could kill myself. 
Yeah. Like he seems. And then they were like, hey, let's do. And then they're like, hey, you could do a late, late show on NBC. He's like, fuck yeah, sign me up. Yeah. He's like, I hate everything you see. Nobody watched it. Everything you see, Carson Dalian looks like he is like the most miserable person in the world. You know what? There is a part of me that honestly feels like at one point, Carson Daly on his on his late because he did like late, late, like the late, late, late show. I think his like on NBC, it was like after Seth Meyers, what Seth Meyers is now. Or did he? No, I'm no, I'm saying it was after that. Was, I think well, last call. That was the name of it. Last call because it was it was it was the Tonight Show. And then it was late night with Seth Meyers. And then it was this fucking last call with Carson Daly. And I would put money on it that at one point, like Carson Daly probably just like ripped off every single stitch of clothing he had and just like jerked his dick for 20 minutes because he knew not a single soul was watching. Richard, do you I could get away with anything. Do you realize that he did last call with Carson Daly from 2002 to 2019? Oh, my God. Almost 20 years. Damn. He you did. know, at one point, he just jerked off on camera. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm knew. saying. Like, everything I've seen he him in, he's it. just like, I just, like, this sucks. Like, I just want a job. I want to, like, I have integrity. I wanted to be an artist, and here I am on TRL. Total request. You know lies. what? I don't think that's it. Honestly, you know what? I you know what I feel. I feel like he wanted to be Ryan Seacrest, but he couldn't figure it out. No, I think he wanted to be more of like Headbangers Ball. Like he wanted to be that kind of guy. Because like, you think so? Oh yeah. Because like whenever you saw him, he with, seems way too poppy for like Headbangers Ball. I think he had to become that because. Back when, uh, like this 2000, you know, like 99 to 2001, 2002, like you had like whatever corn and stuff like that was on, he seemed like legitimately like, oh, yeah, this is awesome, like rock and roll, like I love this stuff. But then it became yeah, more but he, okay. But here's the thing is that Carson Daly, like on MTV, Carson Daly had to contest with Matt Pinfield, and Matt Pinfield on MTV oh, yeah. was a fucking encyclopedia of anything that had to do with rock music. That man could spit facts on the, at the drop of a hat. He could tell you, he could tell you shit about a band that the band doesn't even know. And there's, I'm, I'm sorry, but like, you're like, you're no m- fucking Matt Pinfield. I don't care. Matt Pinfield had looked like a fucking, like a toe. What? His whole head looked like a toe. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I think, because uh, that's more of like a historian. But I feel like Carson would have been more of like the so interviewer smart. journalist type person, but for rock music. Yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, like, think not, about. Not against Pinfield. Like, what if you got that job, Richard, in like 2000, 2001? Like, Ozzy, I think, was having some stuff come out. Um, like you said, Corn. Uh, yeah, he had a. He, well, he was kind of doing. He'd put out like a collection of songs, and then he'd throw like a couple. He'd throw a couple bonus tracks on there. Yeah, but like you see, TRL the list of it. Like you'd have you know some rock bands at the top of that, and you still had Britney and NSYNC and stuff like that, kind of pushing their yeah. way in. But you're like, oh, this is great. Like it's it's a decent mix, and all of a sudden it's like, well, now there's one rock song on there now there's two m&m songs on there now there's no rock bands on there yep now yep. you've got now it's all backstreet yeah and so at that then point backstreet came you back know, you're getting that trl money and that trl fame you're like well what am i gonna do like rock music's gone and rock kind of had that hard fall like i think napster really helped rock quite a bit but then when they started hammering down on that like it just well i think that I think that uh, with the advent of the internet, I think that mu- not just rock, but I I don't I wouldn't say that rock necessarily like fell, but I will say that I think that music in general started to become much much more niche, to where like people gravitated towards their camps. And then stake their claim, mm. and nobody crossed, and nobody crossed boundaries. Yeah, I mean, you're kind of like, I don't know what it's at today, because I'm kind of like old man at this point. Because like, I don't even know if people listen to the radio anymore. Like, I know people do, but do they really? Like, you got Spotify telling you what's popular, not you know, top forty radio. Yeah, but okay, like Spotify tells you what's popular, but 
do you listen to and <clears throat> do no. you listen to what's popular on Spotify? No, you listen to the playlist that you've spent the past four years curating. Yeah, but I mean, I'm 35 at this point, so it's like, hey, here's this. It's tough. What really sucks is when you find that band and you like like it, like you're like, oh man, I really dig this, and you look back and they have like 12 albums. You're like, ah. Oh. Like that's a lot of work to get <laughs> to like know what the songs are to listen to them. Like, whew, I got a lot to do. I listen to like weird niche stuff now, like fucking just like weird off the wall shit that like you could never even possibly conceive of. Sean, you know what I listen to now? You know what I'm really what I've been really listening to? For, actually, mode. I listened to earlier today. No, no, Sean, I found a band that they take um, songs from old Nintendo games <laughs> and they put it, they take songs like old 8-bit songs from old school Nintendo games and they put it to mariachi music. You sent me it's something with the, that. Yeah, I think. It's called the Mariachi Entertainment System and it is <laughs> chef's kiss. It is chef's kiss good. It's the Mariachi Entertainment System or MES. So is that where you know you're old? Where you're like, hey kids, come listen to this new band. <laughs> They're like, Dad, Guys, we're... it's mariachi music, but it's a, but they take songs from fucking Mega Man from 1985. Dad, we're busy listening to WAP. What's that stand for? Oh God, kids, go to your room. Ben Shapiro told me about that. <laughs> I know what that means. Yeah, that's a he medical says it's condition. bad, but I don't get it. <laughs> I think it's fear of the unknown, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> I am. So, yeah, that's what I listen to now. I listen to fucking like weird shit because I like it. Like I said, I've been feeling like super nostalgic. So I've been going back to like uh, albums that I listened to in my first car with my subs. Like, is, th- is this what is this what spurned the, the Limp Biscuit? No, uh, what spurned the Limp Biscuit? Because so Limp Biscuit kind of falls in that like Eminem. Like, there was a lot of kids in my school that were kind of, like, rap fans. And, like, my favorite band's Papa Roach, and they are definitely kind of what you would call new metal or rap metal. But I wouldn't compare them to Lip Biscuit at all. Like, no. It, I always, it always felt to me, it felt like they kind of, like, kind of, like, rode, they kind of, like, hopped on Corn's coattails and kind of, yeah. like, use use that to, like, you know, bring them up a couple notches. Are you talking Limp Biscuit and or then Papa Roach? Limp Biscuit. Oh, okay. Like, yeah. Limp, like, because they had, um, because I think Corn, Limp Biscuit was on Corn's third album. And then it seemed like that second album had a bunch of people on there. Corn was on there. Fucking, wasn't Method Man, Red Man on? Oh, Limp Biscuit's third album, The Chocolate Starfish. Yeah. Yeah. They had a, yeah. That was, yeah. Ugh. Like, so, well, I was trying to get to like so like when Eminem came out with My Name Is, um, like yeah, em, like there was like a kid who got it like opening night or release day or whatever, and like everybody's looking. Yeah. I was like, hey, dude, can I see that? And he's like, no. I was like, oh, I was like, well, fuck you then. I'll go buy it. Like this has yeah. got to be good music, right? And I buy it. I listen to it. I'm like, no, this is not like mm-mm, not my thing. You didn't like it? Mm-mm, no. And so, like, Limp Bizkit was kind of that same boat. They were coming out with a new album. I never had uh, Significant Other, so I was like, well, I mean, everybody likes Limp Bizkit. I like break stuff. You know, yeah. let's get this. And then, like, you listen to it, and you're like, they're just ripping off a bunch of other songs. Like, <laughs> welcome to the jungle, punk. Take a look around. It's Limp Bizkit fucking up your town. Oh, but I still remember it, so it's got to be good. I think you still remember it because it's it's... It does have a well weird kind of earworm quality. Like some of those songs do have like an earworm kind of thing to it. Yeah, it's a. I think it just has to do with repetition. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's kind of like whenever your kid makes up a song, you're like, "That's kind of funny." You kind of start humming to it. But yeah, you're like, yeah, exactly. It just kind of digs in there. See, watch, watch. I can do it with you right now. This is completely unprompted. Ready, ready. Here we go. Keep rolling, 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 rolling. What? See. Now I know you all be loving this shit right here. Shit right here. Biscuit is right here. Biscuit is right here. Is right here. Oh my Put god. Because if you don't care, <laughs> then we don't care. Then we don't care. <laughs> I hate you. God, I hate myself. See? Yeah. 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 And you I feel guess the dirty. Other thing you is feel like dirty you have... when you do it, but you can't help but yeah. do it. 
Yeah. I guess the it's thing the is- shave, it's like shaving a haircut. Yeah. Well, whenever Tiff is like, let's get rolling, I'm like, rolling, 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 rolling. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing with that too is, you know, they're really just saying their name in every song or spelling it out. Yeah. Yeah. But Richard, I'll take you to a time before Chocolate Starfish. So this is, like I said, this is right after Three Dollar Bill, y'all. After they started getting some success with Faith, and they're about ready to record the video for Nookie. Now, remember, yeah, yeah. this is 1999. This is a long article, so I'll probably kind of go through some of the spots that I thought were interesting. Okay. But, like, again, this is 1999. No cell phones. No Twitter. Nope. No Facebook. Internet's more nope. just like nope. blogs and stuff. But yeah, you could be blogs an- and Napster. Napster was around then. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. But you could be. I mean, I heard that there was this thing called Napster around. Oh, man. Like, I don't know if you did this, but what I did is because I'm a goody two shoes. Like, I would listen to like four or five songs from an album on Napster and be like, oh, I really Uh like that. And I'd go buy the album because Um, I use Napster. I use Napster to get a hold of music that I couldn't find. Like, yeah, same boat. um, like if uh, like Ozzy had this uh, like Ozzy had a couple like B side singles that like you know weren't on any album but it was like a B side on a single and so I'm like oh I'll grab that I'll grab that like stuff that I stuff that I'd actually have to like you know like comb record stores across the country to look for oh and you probably still wouldn't find it yeah but I could find them on Napster. Those were the songs that I usually picked up, yeah, like I had all of Papa Roach's like indie releases, but I didn't have a burner on that computer, so i those uh, are lost to time uh, but nineteen ninety nine Richard August Fred Durst likes it to the right with a swivel and a bounce, yeah, I'd like that with the knee out and do that thing with your hips. It's my best oh my Fred God. Durst I, w- I want to punch you in the face <laughs> and I, like. I love you so much, but all I want to do after saying, like, while you're saying that is like, your face just looks so punchable yeah. in that moment. This is, this is 99, 2000, Richard. Like this, this is our, oh. this is our past. He that says, oh, wait, let me, uh, so this is by, uh, Zev Barrow posted this on Yahoo in December 27th of 2020. So, um, remind me to see if I can figure out who the original writer of this article was, but. Okay, okay. So he says, then pauses a moment, narrows his gaze, and rubs the furrow soap soul patch on his chin. Five <laughs> little female dancers in clingy black synthetic fibers stare back at him, hanging on his every word. Like this? One asks, doing that thing with her hips. Nah, to the right, he replies. The right is dope, the left is whack. The dancers complies and Durst oh eyes my. widen. Yeah, that's the dope shit. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Richard, in your life, how many times did you say dope shit? <laughs> I I I don't think I've ever said it. I'm sure somebody will correct me. <laughs> the guy's just like a walking roofie at this, you know, isn't he? Yes. Yes, he is. Like this is like every like when I was so like I started college in 04. It's like the personal embodiment of a date rape drug yeah. come to life. Yeah. Like the epitome of your bro, like not bro, like your uh, frat boy. Yes. Because how many red hats did like sold between like 99 and 2004? Oh. Like too many. Oh, uh, the lit biscuit front man is choreographing his bisquets in a small dance rehearsal space near times square in New York city. There's an old wooden piano in the corner, but the only music in the room comes courtesy of a small boom box playing nookie. The first single from significant other lip biscuit, second rap, Metal effort. Tomorrow, he will direct the Nookie video, which will include the dancers styled like Little Freds and khaki dickies, shell-toed Adidas sneakers, and backwards baseball caps. Thousands, Richard, of rabid Limp Biscuit fans, and remarkably enough, an alive and kicking Polly Shore. Polly Shore is alive, Richard. Oh, he's not dead. Okay, take it from uh, the top. Durst says, and then starts bouncing and swiveling a bit himself, singing along to the tracks. Unbashed, stupid chorus. I did it all for the nookie. Come on, the nookie. So you can take that cookie and shove it up your, yeah. You know, I'm, you know, I could probably pull this video up on YouTube, but I don't want to because I know, like, I'd watch it and then just, like, it's like, it's like every, it's like, if you're, if you're a kid, if you're a kid from the 90s, it's like your secret shame. Yeah. Yeah. 
The opening's like good, you're though. Om- like, you're embarrassed. Like, you're, like, people, you know, like, I'm embarrassed to say that I listened to and liked Limp Biscuit. Not all of it, but, uh, you know. Yeah. Enough that it's considered, not enough that it's not okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this, like, you have to think, like, how many people our age, like, were riding around in their cars, windows down, bursting with this album. Yes, yes. It was this and Kid Rock. That was the other one. Ah, yeah. I did like I did like Kid Rock. I did. I own the first Kid Rock album. That was it. That's as far as I went. He had after the first after the first album. I was like, we're done. We're done here. He had something. I'm trying to remember what it was on. He had like a greatest hits album. It was like his second one because he had been like putting stuff out since like 1992. Yeah. Did you know that uh, Kid Rock and Eminem in Detroit had a rap battle? And Kid Rock won. Oh, I'm sure Kid Rock like told everybody that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Eminem never denied or confirmed it. So, yeah, because he's Eminem. He's like, "Fuck you! I'm worth eighty gajillion dollars. I don't give a fuck what Kid Rock thinks yeah, or I w- says." I wonder, like, how is Kid Rock doing now? Like, is he still getting any ball oh. to ball money? Oh, I know. Yeah, I mean, I know he did a lot of like country stuff. He did like the last time I saw him, it was that picture of him where he looks like a he looks like a mid a dad in his mid fifties with the fucking with these pants that are that look like they're made out of an American flag. Yeah, well, these guys are pushing fifty now. It says he's worth one hundred fifty million, which you can't you know really... why because there's no justice in the world, Sean. Well, Eminem is worth two ten, so you know, like I know, I know, you said you weren't big on the on on Eminem. And like I listened to it, and I wasn't really hu- I wasn't really big on it either. However, even then, I was like, you know, it's not my cup of tea. But I totally, I totally understand why people like this and are going to like it. It was too. Um, so you have to remember, like, so when I got into music in two thousand, I had Papa Roach's Last Resort and then Broken Home. Which were two mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. very specific, specifically written songs, right? Like right. they had me they have meaning to them. Yeah. And my name is does not really carry the same weight as somebody talking about their broken home. Yeah. Oh, of course. So I always felt like Eminem and Limp Biscuit were kind of and like Chocolate Starfish really does this, where it's more kind of like we're writing this like comedic album that's like it didn't like those didn't feel like they're gonna stand the time right like no i i i i i was pretty sure the eminem was gonna last because as much as you know like yes it's it's you know it's you know he's comedic in his delivery but like those are very well written songs no yeah i'm not saying they're bad i guess i feel like they very much feel dated in the time that they were written Oh yeah. Like oh, sure. You listen to <clears throat> and and uh, this might be a little bit of my biases, but like I feel like if you listen to like Last Resort and Broken Home now, people can relate to that and be like, "Oh, I mean, like I could see somebody writing that song today." But in terms of like my name is, it just feels very much like that time. And maybe it's because I I'm not as not as big of a fan of it in general. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I feel yeah, I mean Eminem really didn't really didn't really start getting like personal about his shit until a little later where he started talking about like, you know, like his mom. Yeah. When he settled all of his lawsuits. Fuck you, Debbie. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Richard, Fred Durst is a rapper, video director, choreographer, stylist, producer, AR scout and fledging filmmaker, graphic designer, major network and connoisseur of great asses. Um, can you can why didn't you put air quotes around any of the things you just said? Uh, so again, I wanted to mention this. So this is a quote from this 1999 article, and Durst uh-huh. turns. So we're talking about him talking to those dancers. Durst turns back towards the dancers. Dope, you guys look great. His voice gets low and sincere. You know you all have got great asses. If you didn't, you wouldn't be in this video. And I don't mean that in a bad way. <laughs> it's Fred Durst, Richard. Uh, 
He's a he's a poet even when he's not even when he's not singing. Yeah. So lyrical this, master, this man. This article, he has his set sight on being Alt Rock's first Master P style mogul. Which Oof. is Master P like he kind of fell pretty hard, didn't he? Dude, Master P had some had some fucking cash though. Master P was like gold plated toilet money. Yeah, because didn't he have his own uh or like he was invested in one of like his own sports league or something for a bit or team. I think it was that. I I think Master P had like a solid gold pool. Damn, that's dangerous because gold's soft. You step in like a sink. like a like. It wasn't like an Olympic sized pool, but I think he had a a solid gold pool. Yeah. I don't remember. MC Hammer Master did P too. was fucking rich as shit. Uh, so also Richard, like you can kind of show the time. So echo- echoing that Leonardo da Vinci must have said at least once he declares, yo people who think I'm just all about one thing or fucking messing the whole fucking point. You know, I love the, I love the voice you're doing for this because that's exactly how it's, how I picture it sounding in my head. Yeah. Like it's one of the, like, I feel like that you're really, you're, you're a hundred percent selling it for me here. Like that's how he talks like in public, but in private, like he just probably talks like normal. Like, no, so. no, he doesn't. <laughs> no, that's how he talks all the time. Uh, yo, he goes, he goes to a movie theater. He's like, yo, let me get a box of raisinets. <laughs> <laughs> how much that cost? Three dollar bill, y'all. <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna get some popcorn up in my grill. So, like you said, uh, he had he was good friends with corn, and so that's kind of where it kind of helped because apparently Fred Durst was also a tattoo artist, and he uh, tattooed one of the corn uh, members. Oh, it I was didn't... monkey, wasn't it? This uh, this said that three dollar bill y'all went double platinum after face. I believe it. I believe it. Uh, he says, though, still Limp biscuits have been constantly dissed by critics and corn fans alike. People say we're one of bees or corn ripoffs. And you just know they've never even really listened to what we do, Durst complains. He says he used to frequent Limp Biscuit chat rooms on the internet, but stopped because there's too many people talking shit. <laughs> Everybody's mean to me. <laughs> Nobody likes my arm. <laughs> it makes Actually, me want to break like, Nobody likes my arm. He's like in his I room. hate him. He throws something. I like, hate him so much. His mom. Mama, from, mama, why did they do it to me? <laughs> from the other room after he throws something, his mom's like, Frederick, stop breaking stuff. <laughs> I'll break your fucking face tonight, mom. Wait a second. <laughs> Now, with a new album and a laundry list of upcoming projects, Durst is out for some respect, Richard. It's hard not to yeah, root for never, him. Ever yes, got it. It's very easy not to root for him, at least a little. An excitable dreamer who comes off much younger than his 28 years. He's the kind of guy who will suddenly declare that he's just thought up a million-dollar idea, then grab a napkin to take down notes about a heavy rock meets hardcore rap. We are the world type record for charity. See, the thing is, is that like he, tr- like I always felt like he was trying to, like they tried to sell Limp Biscuit as like it's hard rock meets hard rap, and I'm like, it's not either of those things. No, yeah, you know, they, like he's not NWA missed- and he's not fucking Corn. Yeah, they kind of missed the new metal boat and they kind of missed the rap rock boat. You know what it is? You know what exactly what Limp Biscuit is? I can I just thought of this, okay? You know how you go into a restaurant, okay? Let's say you go into you just go into a restaurant, okay? And they give you a menu and you open up the menu and you see tacos, Chinese, chicken fried steak, mussels, sea bass, uh Cajun salmon, gumbo, and uh, I don't know, corned beef and cabbage. And you see all this on the same menu. What is your first thought? Your first thought is all of these are going to be shit. Yeah. Like you're good. You, you do all of these badly. Yeah. There's too much genre mixing here Ex- for anything to be exactly. good. Exactly. Exactly. When you go into a restaurant and you yeah. open up the menu and it's got like a hunt and there's like, a hunt. I've literally been in restaurants that have like, 50 60 dishes on the menu mm. 
Turn I've worked around. in restaurants that have had 40, 45 dishes on the menu. And the thing is, is that you don't you can't do any of them well mm-hmm. because you do because the key to being a good restaurant is do one thing well. And yeah. I'm not saying your menu has to be like, you know, like five, like, you know, two appetizers, four main four main courses and three desserts, but like keep it to like a page. Maybe a page and a half. But you know what? You go to those restaurants and you open up that thing. It's like four main dishes and like three appetizers and like a couple soups. You're like, well, there's not really a whole lot to choose from. So I'll pick this thing because like there's like one type of steak. It's like, okay, well, I guess I'll do that. Always delicious. Like yeah. it may not yeah. be exactly what you want, but it's delicious and you're happy with your it's decision. Good. Yeah. Limp Biscuit is the is the fusion restaurant of music. You're like, hey, we do rock and rap. We don't do either of them well, but we do both okay. Yeah, and we've got some metal on the side if you like that kind of thing. Yeah, but the thing is, is that you know what? You don't do both okay. No. You do both shit. And I think what what in this next paragraph really like, and this is you think early Fred Durst really illustrates. I think the the other reason. So like, I like music because like to me, music is an art. Like it's an expression. You know, hundred percent. As I've gotten older, I feel like I've been kind of jaded by hearing bands talk about like their sophomore and junior albums, where it's like, yeah, like we kind of were told to do this and this, and the recording studio kind of made us tweak this here and there. Yeah, and so it's yeah. not really their art as much as it's like, okay, well, it's a, a record by committee. Here you go. I always yeah. feel like Limp Biscuit stuff was always that. After, specifically, probably like Significant Other forward. So, Durst is sitting in a large van idling outside the Sunset Strip Hotel, where his bandmates have been staying while Limp Biscuits finish their new record. All right, yo, listen up, he says, breaking down the band's money situation like a B-boy accountant. We're going to take, like, three million for publishing. Now, just pretend that half of that is gone for taxes. I I bet some of that didn't make it to taxes, Richard. Some probably made it to his pocket. (gasps) What? So that's 1.5 mils. Make sure the reporter writes down they're going to taxes. (laughs) That's 1.5 mils split five ways. That's like 300,000 each. Not too fucking bad, huh? Durst handles all things financial for Limp Biscuit and pretty much everything else as well. My band has life easy, he says. But they're not the kind of people who want too much on their plate. I make sure they get whatever they want and they don't want too much. Like, does this not sound like a mob boss? No, this sounds like this sounds like Bernie Madoff. This sounds like that shady accountant that you yeah. have. That's like, don't worry, I'll take care of everything. Well, I feel like he's like, because like, so uh, the band has got twenty one and twenty two year old Otto and Rivers. Uh, they've got DJ Lethal, who's twenty nine. And then they've DJ got... Lethal. You know what? As as shit as that band was, I did like DJ Lethal. I thought he was actually a really good guitarist. DJ Lethal was the DJ. Or the DJ, I yeah. mean. Sorry. Uh, Borland. Wes Borland was the, the guitarist. Borland. Um, yes. And he was 25. So... Or, tw- yeah, 24. And he was definitely, like, the outlier. Like, he was the dude that wore, like, weird clothes, mask, all kinds yeah. of weird stuff. Yeah. I, I did like... I did like Borland. Uh, so talking about Borland, so you know, Durst says, Borland is cool, says Durst, but we have different tastes. I just don't deal with him at one point. Before the band was signed, Durst kicked him out for a while, but soon realized that there wasn't anyone as good as him who I liked so much. So now he's the guy who makes us listen to Wheeze on the tour bus. So this is my favorite part of this article, Rich, because you have to remember, this was so Borland's been kicked out of the band once and brought back. And we yeah. know later on he left the band. So Right. The uh, person not too long after this, I think, right? I think it was right after Chocolate Starfish. Like, I think yeah, they finished yeah. Chocolate Starfish, and he's like, "I'm, I'm done. Like, this is stupid." Yeah. yeah. Um, I am not rolling, rolling, rolling with you. So they asked, "Where will you be in ten years from now?" Rivers says, "In a big old mansion in the Caribbean." Otto says, "In two mansions, one in the Caribbean, one in Hawaii." Lethal says, "Making beats." Borland says, probably not in the band. 
<laughs> and Durr says that between 10 and 20 million units sold. It's like right away, these are just like guys who are like, nope, this is stupid. This is dumb. <laughs> what are we doing here? Why are you people listening to this? Uh, who was it? Dave Grohl. Dave Grohl always said that like, you know, he always, the one thing that he hated the most about like American Idol was that it was like you were saying it was like music by committee. He's like that's not he's like that's not how you make music. He's like the way you just you get some you get some bullshit instruments that you buy at a yard sale, you get your friends together and you go into the you go into a garage and then you sound like shit for like 2 years. And then in year and 3 you still and, sound like shit, but you're a little bit yeah, better. Yeah, you just yeah, you just go into your garage, like hang out with your friends, and just sound like complete ass for ever, for a long time, and then eventually you might emerge as like a you know as a fairly cohesive unit. Yeah, I feel. I mean, I think that's like I I had a guitar when I was sixteen, but it was one of those things that like right away when I couldn't play Stairway to Heaven, I'm like, this is stupid. But if you had a group of people who's like, well, I can't play it either. I can't play it. Well, let's try to play it together. And you jam for like an hour or two every other day. My son plays guitar probably like an hour or two a day. Yeah. Like that's... he just sits in he just sits in his room and, and just and just plays guitar. And I so so wish that that would have been me. I so wish that I would have done that. Well, because th- like he sits upstairs and he's like, I hear him like playing like Santana. Like he can do the intro to Black Magic Woman. Mm-hmm. He's been playing for like two years. Well, and today too, like it's really like, I think when when we were younger, like you really kind of needed like a support group essentially. And if you yeah, didn't have that, yeah. it was real difficult. But like today, you know, it's like, hey, like your son wants to learn how to play a song. Okay, well, let me go on YouTube and see if somebody teaches me how to play the song. Like you've yeah, got a he, lot of he that say stuff. He does that a lot. He like looks at, he looks at videos on YouTube, not of people necessarily playing, but just like videos of the guitar tabs and oh, stuff. Yeah. He'll just look stuff. He can just look stuff up on his phone and just play everything that way. Yeah. Cause tabs is a really easy way to kind of get it going. Yeah. Uh, so this talking about, uh, Limp Biscuit, they were not an overnight success. This is uh, Tom Wally, the president of Interscope. So they toured forever. Limp Biscuit did time with the Warped and Family Values and played a slew of small clubs. What was most exciting about those early shows was that you could tell that there was this new audience out there, kids and Adidas's who were into both rock and rap. Corn's audience. Yeah, they were all co- yeah, they're called Corn fans. Yeah. We felt that Limp re- Oh, guy calls them Limp. <laughs> uh, we felt that Limp I mean, wouldn't L Biscuit be better? I don't think any of it's better. Yeah. I don't think any of it's good. Is it just like this? Just this whole story just make you go like, Ugh. yeah. So like there's a time where Limp Biscuit was. I mean, it was a short. It was like a, a year and a half, two year run. But they were probably the you biggest know, band. You know, um, I occasionally get down. Like I like I get a little depressed. Um, and and hundred percent serious. Like you get. Sometimes I get a little depressed that I feel that we, as a society, as a as a collective, I feel like we have not, uh, like evolved as a society. You know what I mean? In what way? Like sometimes you just like you flip through, like you flip through the news, and like you see people like saying stupid things or doing stupid things, and you're like, like when are we gonna get past this? Like, when are we going to clear the hurdle and just be better people, you know? But then I read, but then I hear about you talking about <laughs> Lip Biscuit, and, I, and it gives me hope because I'm like, you know what? We have moved past this. Yeah, that's a great we've, point. We've evolved. Yeah. We've actually, you, we've come a lot farther than I thought we have. Yeah. There was a time, Richard, as a collective, where the lead singer of a band said that, "Hey, you bitches got fine asses, and if you didn't, you wouldn't be up here." We've, yeah. we've gotten a little bit past that. We've gotten past that, and that makes me feel good. Yeah, that gives me that gives me hope for the future. I'm like, you know what? If we can clear that hurdle, like, who knows? Sky's the limit to the moon. We could we could really make it to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> we could roll, 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 roll all the way to Mars. Perhaps 
the 90s label that made its name distributing the gangster rap of Death Row Records. They're talking about Interscope. And also brought the world Nine Inch Nails, Marilyn Manson, and Eminem. Interscope yeah. has had unparalleled success in taping or tapping the right youth movement at the right time. Making it yeah, massive. ask Nine Inch Nails what they think. What he think? Ask ask Trent Reznor what he thinks about Interscope now. I'm sure he has a fairly different story. You know what sucks about a lot of those artists is they essentially like. So basically, you have a band like Nine Inch Nails. Papa Roach is a great example too. You know they work really hard for six, seven, eight years, like just scrounging and like touring and doing all they can. And then yeah. a con, a, like a record company comes along and says, all right, listen, we want to sign you to a record deal. And you're like, oh, my God, we're big. We're going to make some money. You okay. sign yeah. that record deal. And what you realize, Richard, is that you're signed up for three albums. You're like, oh, my God, it's fucking awesome. We're going to make three albums. This will be great. Yep. And then you realize that they will own your name, everything you write, all that you do, and you can't do a thing thing without them and the only way you're going to make your money is by touring which they loan you the money for that you have to pay back yep yeah the only the out of that entire list that you just said i feel like the only one that got out from under that is is trent there's um so because you say nine inch nails i mean nine inch nails is trent Reznor. Yeah. like that's like he, does he he's own the band does he own nine inch nails or is yeah okay yeah He's completely he he he's completely independent now. He tours like his tours are all self financed. His albums are self financed. Like he is one hundred percent independent. Some of those, so Spotify has even though a lot of people kind of complain about like how they pay out on Spotify, but like Papa Roach, um, I know they talk about like you know it's it's pennies per listen or whatever, but those pennies add up, but after they got out of their record deal, like they've basically kind of been doing the same thing. So these bands that didn't totally screw themselves on their name. So like, I don't know how they did it, but Papa Roach specifically, they don't own like their first, like four albums, but uh-huh. they own the songs. If they play them live. Oh, I see. So you'll get, you'll get some like, uh, you know, live at, dude, Copywritten the the copyright laws for music are so convoluted and fucked up to me. They make absolutely no sense. Yeah, I, it's and it seems like it's just music. Like it seems like it seems like music is the one that's like very like more more than movies, more than anything else. It seems like music is the most heavily regulated artistic medium. When it comes to digital. Yeah. When it makes sense because that stuff can be sold, not just for the song itself, but sold to be used in movies or sold to be used at sporting Mm -hmm. events Mm -hmm. or sold to be used on TV shows or, you know, like there's multiple video games, et cetera. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And that's why, I mean, that's why record companies want to own that because in X number of years, they can sell it to anything and everything and they can put out a best of whatever that they want. Um, Yeah. How stupid is it though that like okay like let's say Sean let's say you buy a video game that has copywritten music in the game and then you like you're like oh I want to stream this and you're streaming the game is playing the copywritten music and then you get a copyright strike yeah it's probably because audio is easier to detect because you could like if if we were like oh yeah with bots yeah you can it's it's much easier to bot you're, yeah you're right because we could put like if we put up a youtube video with like clerks playing in the bottom right miramax or whoever owns it that would come and be like once they figured it out but it'd probably take more time yeah but even like movies and and different media like that like if you write a script and sell it you've basically given up all your rights to that and characters yeah. and all that in there like Kevin Smith, yeah. the only reason he still owns Jay and Silent Bob specifically is because when he was selling clerks, his lawyer's like, hey, maybe like maybe you should like in this contract request that you get ownership of the Jay and Silent Bob characters. And he's like, Why well, I guess, okay, yeah, let's do that. And now that's something that's carried across multiple movies because he owns those characters. Right. Right. But yeah, I mean, all that stuff is like, that's where you're getting into lawyers. That's where you're getting people spending tons of money. And they're like, nope, you're yep. not getting in my cookie jar. Yep. Um, one interesting thing from this article I didn't realize. So there was a New York Times story reporting that Interscope had paid a Portland, Oregon 
modern rock station about five thousand dollars to play counterfeit the counterfeit single 50 times the deal was technically legal but it set off a wave of outrage over some dubbed the new payola the station approached us uh said the president from interscope they explained that it was Uh not by they explained that it was buying advertising time not actual station time so we said sure why not and you'll love Durst how he replies back to this. So he says, I mean, hey, they ended up playing the shit out of the record. It wasn't like we were getting tons of radio play anyway. In fact, it took the stereo the steroid infused faith cover to pierce the rock radio bubble. Yeah, it's true. Nobody heard of him until then. And I I mean, like that first album, I I can count probably three, maybe four songs that like I, I liked. So, I mean, I would call the overall album a win. Yeah. And that was probably like their more like rock or like new metal, rap metal. Like that, like if you say rap metal, that one, feels I think that one like was, it. was much, was, was much harder than anything they've put out since. Yeah. But I mean, it shows that like a lot of the bands from that time could evolve. Like I'll say Papa Roach because it's very much in that time frame. Like, Papa Roach's first album and their fifth album are completely different. Like they're different bands because they've just kind of evolved. They've tried different things. Yeah. Like yeah. Limp Biscuit just feels like they're doing the same thing. Just not as good. Um, I, I mean, I think, I mean, whether or not it's as good, I don't know, but I will say, yes, it's very much the same thing. And I think, you know, as much as people clamor, and 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 as much as people clamor for a band to not change and as much as people like give a band shit when they do something different on an album like that's that's what needs to happen oh yeah <clears throat> like you look at REM like REM put out you know a you know had you know a fairly okay career you know a, actually not fairly okay a really decent career in the 80s and then and then they came out with a hit single that had a fucking mandolin playing on it. Like that was their, you know, yeah. they're like, this is the single. Is that a mandolin? Are you playing a mandolin <laughs> in the background? He's like, yeah, it's called losing my religion. Nobody's going to fucking listen to this. Nobody's going to listen to a song, a single with a mandolin in it. Pearl jam exists. And you want to play it, put a mandolin on the radio. Did, uh, did, yeah. did people listen to that song? Losing My Religion, Sean, it's one of the biggest songs of the 90s. I know. Do you? Yeah. That's me in the spotlight, losing my religion. Um, A band that I liked that did that that I don't think did it well was Linkin Park. Linkin Park's first album was really, really good. Like I can listen to that front to back like all the time. Second one was like one or two songs, and then they got like super experimental, and it kind of... Kind of lost me. Um, yeah, I mean, I could see that. I don't know. I didn't listen to a lot of Linkin Park, so yeah, that was kind of that new I metal can't. kind of. Like I said, yeah, two thousand, yeah. like that. Um, one story I wanted to share with you before we get too far through the rest of this. So, talking about like bands that I really like and kind of the, the douchiness of Durst. So apparently, there's a story out there that uh, so Taproot is a band that came out like in oh two, maybe oh three. I, yeah, I, I I remember them. I love. I can't Root. remember a song that they did, but uh, they did. I can't remember like a song called "Poem." This song okay. is a poem to myself. It helps me to laugh in case of fire. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay, okay. It sounds familiar. Um, and they've had a couple other like that albums that I really like. Uh, Blue Sky Research. If you get a chance, it's pretty good. But yeah. so they were up and coming and apparently Fred Durst was trying to like sign all these bands and they were like, no, like we, we don't, we don't want to sign with you guys. And uh-huh. uh, I don't know if I've heard the voicemail. I feel like I have, but apparently Durst is like, you know, fuck you guys. You guys are going to make it. I'm going to fucking make sure you never play a song again. You're not going to anything. You guys are shit. You fucking suck. Get out of here. I'm going to break your face. <laughs> break your fucking face tonight. <laughs> That's in my song. You can't use it. Yeah, this is that's copyright song in your voicemail, so you can't play it on the internet. Yeah, and then you're and then you're sitting there listening to the message, and you're like, "Man, I feel creepy. I feel like I want to take a shower after listening to him talk." 
Yes, let's see. Uh You know, you know uh I I you know I've just realized we've we've spent almost an hour talking and I feel like all we've done this entire time is found any way shape or form to avoid talking about Lip Biscuit. Well, I mean this whole thing is a lot about just like this time frame. So I'll leave this last one which again kind of gives me a lot of creepy vibes cuz remember he's 28 years old. And this is in an oh, article published in 99 like this isn't like this is a legit article oh, here we go so durst is talking and it says he's talking about significant other is so much better i really believe we made an original great record at the very least it's more melodic 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 uh-huh the melodic melodic the bay the bass the bass or bass 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 God damn it. <laughs> the bass is still meant to rattle dental fillings and the guitars are still alpha male but Durst sings more than he screams and there are several radio friendly numbers including the mel- the melancholic cure style ballad no sex i don't remember that song do you remember no sex i don't remember i don't remember it at all he says dude i have no problem with being pop Durst says pop means pop you lur, which is cool with me. Oh, uh, yeah. He says that said. Check your drinks, ladies. Yeah. Uh, I thought there was a. It, so in this article too, as he talks about, he talks about like his first two albums. Um, he talks about how like they were written for a girl that like cheated on him. Apparently, he said like they thought she sh- he thought she was cool, but then she became like a swinging bisexual that slept with all of his friends. Um, um, let's see. But this was the one that kind wait a of, this is the thing that made me a little uncomfortable. So it's like the, the reporter. So if she's bisexual, then, and she's sleeping with his friends. Like, did she need to be bisexual to sleep with his friends? I, it's just what he threw in there. She was a swinging bisexual that slept with all of his cruddy friends. Ugh. Uh, so as God. they're following him, he's talking and all of a sudden he hears some squealing that says, Oh my God, Fred. Laura Blackburn and Marilla Zelikowski, both 16, Richard. They had to point out that these two girls were 16. No, Both wearing eye glitter and pink pagers uh, have just noticed Durst. He tells his girlfriend to wait, flashes a thousand watt smile, and ushers the fans over. Do you guys know we've got a new record coming out? You're going to buy it. Are you going to go out and buy it? Yeah. You know, we make music for women like you, Durst flirts. You listen to lyrics. Guys just want to go wild and bust each other up. After Durst walks away, Blackburn gushes. He's so cute. We thought we saw him backstage at the QR OQ Christmas show, and we were like Fred. <sighs> it wasn't really him, though, moral size. <laughs> it was Vanilla Ice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's just like a good, it's a good portent for the future. That's what that is. Oh, uh, but Richard, uh, I don't know if it was a great journey, but I saw that article. And uh, when I first clicked it, I thought it was kind of like a retrospective of like that uh-huh. time frame. Uh, I didn't really realize it was like a, here's it's like, oh, let's, let's wax philosophical and reminisce on the career that was Limp Biscuit, exactly. And then you realize, oh, wait, there was no career. <clears throat> so. Yeah, there it is. It's like, oh, let's look back to see how they were so popular. Instead of it's like, oh, my God, do you know this most popular band ever, Limp Biscuit? They're going to be like the next Guns N' Roses, the next Alice in Chains, <laughs> the next Doors. Oh, dear fucking God. Yeah, but they weren't, Richard. I think he broke some dude's neck jumping off of a thing, too, at Woodstock, didn't he? Oh, shit, I don't remember. Yeah, I don't know. Weird times the night, late 90s, early 2000s. True that. True story. Yeah. But Richard, um, I guess as we're kind of rolling, rolling, rolling. Stop. What are some stop. Richard's closing <laughs> thoughts that you have? Um, well, like I said earlier, we spent an entire hour talking about Limp Biscuit and basically digressing at every single point we could to not talk about Limp Biscuit. And um, I think I summed it up earlier by saying that. I'm glad that we as a as a collective society, not just as a music loving society, not just as music fans, but just as people. I'm glad that we as people have moved past the era 
of Fred that was Fred Durst because that makes me that gives me hope gives me hope for the future um makes me realize that kids aren't kids aren't stupid and that makes me happy cuz we Richard were stupid because we did give Fred Durst some money <laughs> we did uh, i i can un, i can say that yes he probably has a couple of my dollars. Yeah. What's well, okay, Richard? Just remember, you just gotta have faith. Gotta have faith. End this show. <laughs> All right, let me do a little bit of housekeeping. Visit our website, we're lingerdebrones.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at lingerdebro. Email us at bros at lingerdebrones.com. And we always like to thank the most rock stars of our listeners, our patron men- members, Wendy and Aaron. If anyone ever asks, we will say that you will never Limp Biscuit fans. Yeah, we would not. You, we would not take you to a Limp Biscuit concert. We'd take you to a better show. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, Richard, is there anything else before I close her out? No, and no. All right. Well, that's all the Bruins have for this show. I'm Sean, and I'm Richard. And remember, don't be a why, be a be a why not. not. I still think I have my Chocolate Starfish album, actually. I probably do too. You know what I need? You know what? Actually, you know what I should do with that chocolate starfish album? I got to find it. You know why? Hang on. Give me some to break. <laughs>